Daniel Pomerantz is the CEO of HonestReporting.com, a media monitoring NGO based in Jerusalem, and he joins us now. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, as we just said, Sukkot begins tomorrow. Obviously, there is some anticipation to see if the ultra-Orthodox community will abide by the restrictions over the holiday. We've seen from previous holidays that even with the lockdown, the community, you know, held some mass gatherings. And now the health ministry is saying that one third of our COVID-19 cases are coming from the ultra-Orthodox sector. Now, do the members of this community believe celebrating is more important than the restrictions or will they likely reduce gatherings? I mean, are they afraid of the virus? Well, in, in Orthodox communities tend to respond most of all to the direction of the local community rabbi, not to a single uh, central source of information. And so there's a variation in what different communities believe. But there are certainly some ultra-religious communities that either don't take the virus very seriously or simply believe that religious observance is more important, just as there are secular communities that believe that uh, political protest is more important, either because they underestimate the virus or uh, put a higher importance on the other activity. Absolutely, and I do want to get to those protests in just one second. But, you know, a large part of this holiday is, is gathering with your entire family in what is called a sukkah, you know, this little makeshift house that people build in their backyards to eat in and sleep in and do all kinds of things in during this holiday. So obviously that gathering is a really important part of this specific holiday. Will they still have Sukkot in their backyards and will they still invite people over to celebrate together? Uh, it, it appears that people will. Uh, there's ways to do it within the guidelines, but as we've seen, people often violate the guidelines. Sometimes our political leaders violate the guidelines. Uh, Israel is a country that places a great deal of value on personal independence and on arguing and it's, uh, it's a vibrant democracy, and vibrant democracies are not ideally suited to handle virus outbreaks. And so it's going to be a challenge, whether because the guidelines aren't good enough or because they aren't well enforced enough, or simply because people just aren't taking them seriously enough and are placing uh, personal individuality over the, uh, the safety of our, our society as a whole. Sure, and you know, as a vibrant democracy, uh, protesting is a big part of that, as we just touched on a second ago. So now that these protests have been, you know, severely limited, what kind of an impact does that have on Israel's democracy as a whole? Is this, you know, something that can help Netanyahu politically, or it's not about that at all? I don't believe this will have a significant impact on Netanyahu politically. His criminal charges have been known for a long time. They haven't. Uh, those criminal charges have not had a significant effect on his popularity ratings uh, or that of his coalition throughout the past couple years nor throughout the past three elections. Uh, however, uh, in Israel, even more so than in other democracies, protest is a significant way of expressing political will and creating change. And it does create a certain danger in that protests are dangerous because they can spread the virus. But on the other hand, a lack of protest is dangerous because if the COVID-related restrictions were in some way uh, politically uh, incorrect, politically um, uh, unviable, that they actually violated people's rights in a way that didn't help keep people safe without protests, we would lose our most important tool for communicating that to our elected leaders. I want to speak about um, the lockdown in general. You know, until now, it seemed that, you know, other than some small businesses being banned from opening, largely, you know, life has continued as usual. And because of this, these uh, small business owners feel singled out and therefore they want to rebel against, you know, what's going on. They want to rebel against the authorities. Is there a way to create a lockdown, you know, uh, implement restrictions, flatten the curve while still pleasing everyone politically? Well, it's not possible to please everybody. And this is one of the challenges in a democracy, that a democracy demands that decisions be made by compromise and by consensus. But in the case of a virus, it's simply a fact. The virus spreads more inside than outside. So going to the beach is not nearly as dangerous as praying in a synagogue or, for that matter, eating a meal in a restaurant. And it's not fair and it's not right. But it's not what our government chooses for, it for us. It's what the virus chooses for us. And we have to start listening to the virus and do what makes sense uh, based on what our health officials are telling us. Uh, and at the same time, sometimes it's not going to be fair, but we also have to make sure that we do it in a way that makes sense. If we allow large gatherings, for example, for religious purposes or for protests that do spread the virus and then limit other things that don't really spread the virus as much, people will simply say, look, this doesn't make sense. It's not keeping anyone safe. Why should I suffer for it? 
Right. Well, Daniel Pomerantz, we will obviously have to find a solution together as a country. Thank you so much and happy Sukkot. Have a happy and healthy holiday. Thank you. Likewise.